Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the virtual educational series, our India Reach webinar series, uh, Aerospace Defence and Security Market Trends, Opportunities for Australia and the ASEAN region. This is held with the My Security Marketplace. My name is Chris Coverage. I'm the Executive Editor and Director for My Security Media and our Marketplace. And we are joined by our partners, the Aerospace and Defence Consultants of India, Association and our partner Raman Sapori there in Delhi. Raman, thanks for joining us again. Thank you, Chris. Episode three, we're getting we're getting through them, and uh, the discussions keep happening week to week. Um, let me just get my slides sorted out here. For those that are joining us for the first time, uh, we have a, a broad sort of subject matter. Nothing's really off the table. We uh, seem to be uh, tagging most of our, our discussions around cyber security and cyber warfare and then everything sort of flows out from that. So we are definitely sort of focusing in on uh, cyber security uh, and its connections across all of technology. Um, the name itself provides our sort of direction in terms of aerospace defence and security uh, and we're, we've already touched on things like drones and robotics. Uh, we're going to touch on 3D printing briefly today as well. Um, and for today's uh, discussion is going to be on cyber security education. And we have a number of guests, uh, both here in Australia and also in India. Um, in particular, we've got John Selby uh, here in, uh, in Sydney from Macquarie University. John, thanks for joining us. Lovely to be here. Um, Professor Dali Kafar, the Executive Director for the Optus Macquarie Cyber Security Hub, may join us. He may kind of but in halfway through this, um, but uh, Dali and I have done a number of podcasts in the past and I've mentioned that uh, I was in India last September and it was with the Optus Macquarie Cyber Security Hub, the New South Wales government. So uh, I'll touch on some of the work that Dali and I have done over the last uh, sort of 18 months and 12 months and particularly some of the research that uh, he does and his team does. Uh, on, and in fact, that's where he's, he's busy today, uh, related to some of that research and the, uh, the app. Uh, and then we've also got Commodore Naresh Kumar uh, there in Delhi. Mr. Kumar, thanks for joining us. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. I, I like this title, Officer of Special Duty. That means you're <laughs> senior, but you can do whatever you like, I would imagine. Yeah. Uh, and you're working with the Indian Institute of Technology there in, in Jammu. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I do a lot of things, whatever comes my way. <laughs> Very good. Um, and we've also got Mr. Gaurav uh, Farshni. Uh, Gaurav, um, maybe if you could introduce yourself. I imagine you're with the Institute also, yes? Yeah, I'm, I'm very excited to join this uh, webinar. And uh, I'm an assistant professor at the Department of Computer Science IIT Jammu. And uh, doing research in cybersecurity and uh, uh, a lot of things with industry, uh, with NASCOM, uh, which is a software body in India, and DSCI, which is Data Security Council of India. So uh, I have interest in a lot of things, including uh, security in the defense sector and uh, security of banking and financial. So um, I'm very excited and uh, we want to look forward to opportunities in this domain. Right. Well, look, um, for the audience, the format is if you've got a question, you're welcome to raise your hand. Um, and uh, ask that question. I'll moderate as best I can. Um, we are going to hear a presentation from uh, John Selby on the Macquarie University sort of cybersecurity program, and um, it's something that's come up on our previous episodes one and two in terms of the opportunities there for cybersecurity education, both in both markets, but then also um, sort of the opportunities that Raman has raised, obviously, in India for cybersecurity educators uh, here in Australia. Just before we get underway, uh, we're just going to do our normal introduction and some news of the day and news of the, of the time uh, also. I trust these slides. Next week, we've got a very special guest. We've got uh, Dr. Toby Beacon, the Australian Ambassador for Cyber Affairs and Critical Technology. And he's going to walk us through the cybersecurity international engagement strategy that Australia has, particularly with the region no doubt that will touch on India also, but also with very much our ASEAN partners. Um, and I'll, we spoke to Dr. Beacon last week uh, as, as part of an Israeli series, and I've just released a podcast from that. Um, very, inter very interesting, very insightful, um, and there's a lot happening here in the Australian market 
uh, in relation to that. So that's one to look out for. And we will try at least to uh, invite someone from the India's uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs uh, or External Affairs, I think you call it, Ministry of External Affairs uh, to join uh, us on that particular episode. Uh, and then the following week, episode five is also lined up. We've got the OSCIBE, Australian Cybersecurity Growth Network, which is our sort of startup hub ecosystem for cybersecurity here in Australia. Uh, and we've also, um, I've been able to speak to Shivanji Jain, the Head of Corporation and Global Partnerships from Startup India. And from memory, I think they're in Delhi, the Startup India hub uh, also. So um, these two ladies will join us and we're just diving into that innovation startup and soft security ecosystem development and how India and Australia are developing their own ecosystems and then opportunities there uh, also. Uh, episode one and two are, are locked and loaded on YouTube and you're welcome to, to review those in terms of uh, our previous discussions. Um, but again, I think we're just warming up into this series uh, and it's looking like we might be going through to August at some point uh, as we continue. Um, I touched on, just making sure you're seeing what I'm seeing, the, we held last week with the Australia-Israel Chamber of Commerce, we were joined by Mr Yugal Una, the Director General for the Cyber Security, the National Cyber Security Directorate for Israel, uh, and also with Dr Fekin. Um, that session went for about an hour, looking at the National Cyber Security Strategy, very interesting discussion. Uh, it's something we'll touch on with Dr Fekin next week as well but you get a sense where Israel's at and how they're aligning themselves uh, at, a, at a national cybersecurity level. Um, nothing's new there, nothing sort of came out that was absolutely new. You can definitely see an alignment between Australia and Israel. And as we're all aware, India and Israel are also got a lot going on uh, in particular. So definitely worth of interest. Uh, and that's available on the Australian Cybersecurity uh, Magazine website. Um, and recent news, I imagine, I hope we've reached some uh, of interest there in India. Uh, Australia's released a new defence strategy and a four structure plan um, and really new objectives there. Maybe, maybe not so new, but uh, shaping Australia's strategic environment. Uh, there are new strategies to deter actions against Australia's interests and to respond with credible military force. Definitely some changes in um, sort of what their weaponry in terms of on the border uh, and air defence systems. So something to read. Uh, I'm just starting to write an editorial on this now uh, and uh, lots of useful quotes coming out of that. I won't go dive into it too much deep now. Um, if you are interested from the audience perspective as to the state by state breakdowns uh, on that defence strategy and what it means, we've got a run on the Australian Security Magazine, uh, state by state defence spend is how they're spending uh can't remember how many billions it was but you know it's a 10-year 10-year strategy and a plan and um the australian cyber collaboration center the new center just been opened this week uh, in adelaide uh, as part of that and we you have definitely seen out of these announcements that have come out in the last sort of week or so is an alignment of cyber security and defense uh really a, a key part we touched on it briefly last week week, a $1.3 billion spend over 10 years as part of the defence uh, cyber security spend. Um, recent news, uh, Sarosh, our Mumbai correspondent, a new article he touched on the, the apps that we mentioned last week uh, and the apps that have been banned uh, in India of the Chinese apps. Uh, so there's an article there on the Asia Pacific Security Magazine if you want to dive into that. And also I raised, um, there's a very good interactive map the, the map there on your right is uh, the COVID operations that are running in the Pacific uh, and where COVID is, is being spread. So worth having a look, I only just saw it briefly, uh, but it's an embedded map there and it's uh, worth having a look. It might be something that India is doing or um, I don't, it doesn't include India, but definitely on, on the Pacific uh, for interest. Raman, I'm going to hand over to you. Maybe talk us through this particular event for 3D printing and your association's involvement. Okay. Uh, greetings to everyone. Uh, my name is Raman Sapori. I am the president of Aerospace Defence Consultant Association of India. Uh, during the COVID times, we were wondering what we should do to generate jobs. 
and I was in touch with the Indian military authorities, Air Force, Navy, and Army. And recently, about a month back, Indian Air Force has released a document where specific aerospace components produced in the 3D printing technology will be accepted by the Indian Air Force. This for the first time, this initiative by the Indian Air Force has taken. Uh, what we are trying to do in this particular event is, we were supposed to have a big event, uh, one in Bangalore, one in Delhi, but due to the COVID now it is going to be online. Uh, as you know that India has announced two big defense corridors, one in the north, one in the south. But there are other clusters in India where aerospace defense uh, things are happening. So this particular event will cover the opportunities in the defense and non-defense. In non-defense, there will be auto sector and medical sector, medical uh, opportunities for uh, the 3D printing itself. Post-COVID, the government has released a lot of funds for the healthcare industry itself. So there will be a lot of spend itself. So we are going to have details shared with you uh, along with the 3D printing world where we are inviting all the stakeholders. I would request Chris and team in uh, Australia to join us to cover the message. And this is going to be next generation opportunity. What I am trying to tell my friends in the industry is if you wait for the government and the God to help you come out of the business crisis, nothing will happen. So this is the result of a lot of interaction which has taken place and I would request the Australian side to come out with their stakeholders along with the academia and the industry including the medium small scale enterprise. We see a lot of opportunity and excitement and government of India and various federal governments are supporting us in this particular initiative. Thank you. Chris, over to you. No worries. Thanks, Raman. Looks interesting and we'll stick that on the marketplace as well. Uh, you, you fired through a couple of other snapshots here. Um, one is an expression of interest for Department of Defence production. Uh, maybe if you could walk through these, which papers are you seeing these announcements in? Okay, the slide which you see on the left is the announcement of expression of interest. Uh, Indian government has now announced the private sector to enter into participation with Ordnance Factory Board. We have uh, almost about uh, four dozen factories spread all over India. And uh, now the private sector is allowed to corporatize. They'll be now issuing the uh, shares in the marketplace. So every Ordnance Factory Board in the electronics, in the firearms, in the laser electro optics. There are opportunities both for Indian and uh, private sector. We can set up the joint venture. This is an area which has got a lot of monetization available. That's on the left side. So we will uh, share with you the documents as to what opportunities we can have. So that's on the Ordnance Factory Board itself. The one on the right hand side is post COVID. We realized that a lot of uh, Chinese apps were intruding into the security. We are referring to Zoom. So now the Indian government has uh, announced a competition. So five Indian companies have been shortlisted to participate in a competition. And uh, out of which three companies in uh, stage one will get money. Another two companies at the back will also get money. The one who wins the uh, prize will get a huge sum of money itself. So that is the way the heading is going on. And the response was something like, 3,000 applicants had applied for developing this particular video conference software. So what you see the five startups in India is out of more than 3,000 applicants who developed this software and gave for competition to the Ministry of Electronics and Government of India. Thank you, just, Chris, over to you. Thanks, Raman. Looks like 2,000 applications and uh, some uh, interesting companies there, uh, mainly coming out of Hyderabad. Uh, looks at too. Um, but yet, yeah, we'll, uh, someone's asked a question, are these slides available or is this presentation available? This is being recorded and will be available on, on our YouTube channel. So uh, yes, this slide is technically available. What we're going to do is we're going to hand over and get into our episode three discussion on education. And <laughs> here's the challenge. We have to hand over to, I always make it 
sound harder than what it is. But to John, John, here it comes over to you. Uh, and for the audience, if you've got a question as John makes that presentation, uh, welcome to, I'll be moderating, raise your hand uh, and I'll keep the uh, videos on for our panelists. And if you've got a question, just raise your hand, but I'll mute just so, it, doesn't, it sounds like our, our sound is fine at this stage. Um, but if there's any issues, I'll, I'll start to mute people. John, that should be with you and that's great. We can see your presentation now okay. and over to you. Wonderful, thank you. Thank you for having me. Uh, Raman, one thing I thought I'd mention building upon your uh, talk about 3D printing, the Australian Army just did a trial in the Northern Territory of a, a metal 3D printing uh, equipment out in the field to for their spare parts for the Army and apparently it was quite successful. Okay, so we'd like to get in touch with you. How do they do the certification of that? The challenge with India was that the certifying and qualifying agencies were not used to testing the 3D printing parts. So there was a reluctance. So our uh, the quality assurance team of the Army would like to be in touch with your quality assurance as to how they do this process. So this uh, part of the learning, if we can go from you, that'll be very good for us. Thank you. Okay, I can we we'll talk about that later. All right, so a little bit of information about me. Um, I started doing cybersecurity and privacy last millennium. Um, I was quite young back then. Uh, and my research is quite interdisciplinary. So I integrate law, politics, economics, sociology, history, etc. Um, I've traveled to India a number of times, in particular with the prime ministerial level Australia-India Youth Dialogue. I was a delegate in 2015. And I returned to India in 2018 to speak about uh, cybersecurity issues there. Um, I've also been involved recently um, with the COVID safe debate here. And uh, I don't know whether you're fans of the data localization uh, laws that are proposed in the personal data protection bill, but they were based on some of my research from 2017. A little bit about the cybersecurity hub. Um, we are a full spectrum university level uh, group of academics. So there's more than 60 academics now involved and we do everything from research, um, we do industry and advisory training, we uh, engage in policy debates and policy development, we obviously do teaching etc and we do strategic uh, ventures. So keeping this short because we only wanted to do sort of 10 to 15 minutes rather than an hour, um, we are focused a lot on enabling trust because this is one of the, the big challenges that we have baked the internet into our society when it was coming from a world where its initial design assumed good actors and good behavior would occur. And we've rolled that same architecture into the real world and we're finding that people are not as trustworthy in the real world uh, as we might hope. And that's creating a, a myriad of challenges for civilian life, for business, for uh, political life and for defense. So uh, being able to trust data, trust technology, trust systems and trust people is an immense challenge. And that's informing a lot of uh, the research programs that we do. We've got six cross disciplinary research programs. So this is one of the differences for the uh, Macquarie Cybersecurity Hub as compared to many other uh, universities. We've recognized early on and explicitly that cybersecurity requires far more than pure information technology expertise. That's necessary, but not sufficient. So we've developed these programs that spread across the business faculty, the arts, social sciences, law, etc., cetera, um, as well as information technology. And that enables us to bring together discipline experts to bring insights and challenge each other. What is obvious to one discipline is often quite challenged uh, and debated by other disciplines. And we find that gives us a much richer insights into our research programs, our research projects, and our ability to deliver uh, more informed, more nuanced, more sophisticated recommendations in our research, in our policy engagement, in our consulting work, etc. So 
just an example, some of the cross-faculty research projects, I will not go into these in any detail because they would take us far longer than we have time today. Um, we're looking at issues around cyber deception, uh, privacy law and ethics in machine learning as a service, supply chain, cyber security, money laundering through mobile phones. Um, these are all projects within those programs that cross our faculties together, the academics, uh, to collaborate with each other to, to come up with better solutions. Why are we doing this? Because we recognise that there's a massive skills shortage um, in Australia, in India, around the world in relation to cyber security. And particularly when we're seeing this COVID pandemic leading to an enormous surge in unemployment in societies around the world, um, the ability to create jobs over the next five years, uh, high value jobs in particular, um, that can often be done remotely, um, is something that cybersecurity can assist with and we are actively engaged at the, the regional level, at the national level and at the international level in trying to drive up the skills capabilities of not only Australians, no. but uh, of cybersecurity experts in other countries as well. No. Uh, in terms of our engagement with India, we have had uh, a number of interactions with the Indian School of Business in providing cybersecurity executive education courses. Uh, we've been involved in a number of trade missions through uh, Delhi, Mumbai, Bangalore, Hyderabad, etc. Um, we have an extensive uh, alumni network as well as undergraduates, postgraduates and PhD students who historically have come to Australia each year. Um, at the moment that uh, pipeline is uh, a challenge uh, in the COVID pandemic, but uh, we are being creative as to how we solve that, particularly as we've transitioned to online learning in many cases. And one thing that's been quite unique with Macquarie University is our cyber breach simulation event, uh, where we bring executives in and we take them through the rather stressful experience of, of being hacked and so that they can learn from that so that they can test the extent to which their collaboration strategies, their response plans work in practice without uh, the stress of a real world breach. In terms of what we have for education, because that was one of the, the themes of the presentation, of the discussion to, today, uh, we have both online and on campus courses with a particular focus on executive education up to the board level. We, uh, from management up to board, we have uh, trained quite a lot of uh, PhD students and we offer that training across many different subspecialties from information technology through to uh, psychology, ethics, uh, um, law, business, etc. Uh, we offer a range of different master's levels programs for people looking to skill up and we have a bachelor level program. In terms of the um, interdisciplinary nature of that education, I thought it would be useful just to throw up some examples of the assessments that we get students to do, which might be different to what a student studying cybersecurity from a technology perspective might look at. So for example, a debate uh, to inform a CEO of the competing ethical arguments when the company's been hit by crypto ransomware demand. Why should the company pay the demand? Why should they not pay it? Those are skills that require more than just a technical knowledge of cyber security, but they have a fundamental uh, challenge for our society because paying those crypto ransomware demands fuels the ability of the attackers to launch more sophisticated attacks in the future. So there's a lot of short term versus long term trade offs there. Uh, conscious of time. Um, one final okay. thing I wanted to to talk about um, was a, an issue of the way in which a lot of cybersecurity 
research and education focuses on trying to reduce the supply of cybersecurity vulnerabilities so that the, uh, the attack surface factor is reduced. I also, when I teach my, my students, I get them to think a lot about the demand side. So the, the right hand side of that slide there has a classic supply demand curve. If you've studied economics, it would be very familiar to you. And what we've seen is that the volume of attacks that a country can experience is not just a function of discovery of new vulnerabilities, but it's a function of a great many totally unrelated to cybersecurity technical issues, such as geopolitics. So for example, the North Korean US summit uh, that Donald Trump and Kim Jong-un held in Singapore in 2018, saw a fourfold increase in cyber attacks on businesses and government agencies across Singapore. Now, Singapore itself had nothing really to do with those uh, debates, the negotiation, it was just the venue. But businesses there, government agencies, saw a, a massive surge in the level of attacks that they faced um, as innocent bystanders, effectively. And we've seen this both, you could argue, in Australia and in India in the last uh, few months, as there's been an uh, increase in tensions in relationships with China, where we saw our Prime Minister giving a presentation in Australia on the uh, level of cyber attacks which had occurred against uh, Australian government agencies. And we've also seen uh, press reports in India that as the border tensions had risen there with China, there had been a, a surge in distributed denial of service attacks against Indian websites and payment systems. Um, I saw today, unfortunately, it seems that some, there's been a, a bit of a breakthrough in reducing the tensions on the border there, which is a good thing. And it'll be interesting to see whether that flows through to a, uh, a reduction in the level of those cyber attacks. So this was just a very quick run through of a, a an example of some of the capabilities that Macquarie University has in terms of cybersecurity. We have a depth in both the technical issues in cybersecurity, but also across the broader um, issues that cybersecurity raises in terms of national security, in terms of geopolitics, in terms of business, etc. And on that note, I uh, will hand back to I think stay, just stay on there, John. We'll keep it with okay. you because um, there was a we've got a question from the audience already, and I wanted to maybe just talk about trust briefly, uh, and maybe go back to that slide. But there's a question here uh, for you: What are the steps if an Indian university wants to collaborate with them to offer these programs on cybersecurity in India? What, what's the collaboration process or opportunity? Would you say uh, with uh, between universities, Australia and so India. So we have signed a number of memoranda of understanding between our university and other universities. We have a dedicated director of international engagement, uh, Professor Philomena Leung, uh, who handles the, the negotiation of those relationships and then building upon those um, processes, we would be looking at the um, the particular uh, aspects of delivery of courses, of delivery of training, of research collaborations, et cetera, um, with the hub. So we have a, we've, we've scaled to the point where we have a specialist whose role it is, is to do those particular interactions. Yeah. And I know that was quite active up until uh, a global pandemic hit and everybody uh, is on a bit of hold, I'm sure, and hence why we're doing these webinars. Um, maybe if we give, uh, uh, Commodore, Commodore uh, Kumar, uh, an opportunity. Uh, your thoughts on on the presentation, and maybe the and even Gaurav as well, in terms of what you're seeing and the alignment to these types of courses to what, what you've seen uh, in India, uh, Mr. Kumar. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, uh, John. Very lovely and comprehensive overview of the. Cybersecurity Education in Australia and your university. 
I am uh, glad that Dr. Varshna is there uh, in the conference. And uh, we have a reasonably good computer science department, and we are uh, hosting in tech programs and cybersecurity uh, also. So uh, I would highly recommend that we have a MOU, as you are saying, uh, between Macquarie University and uh, IIT Jammu, and the framework can be drawn in the next visit or next conference or discussion, which you can have with the department uh, of IIT Jammu. Varu, is that okay? Varu, uh, Yes, yes, sir. we will be, will be very interested, actually. We already have yeah. uh, certain MOUs with the uh, Data Security Council of India. We have recently signed an MOU. Uh, we are right. doing uh, industry collaboration for uh, cybersecurity technology development. Uh, right. We are also actually going forward to have a startup in the banking sector. Uh, a solution has yeah. been developed and it is under patenting process. So right. uh, there are so many activities that are going on. Respect but, but to uh, cybersecurity. Yeah. Work which can continue from education perspective. That is IIT Jammu offering the courses in collaboration with the Australian University. Uh, and in um, deep uh, areas of interest, like they have got five different disciplines in cyber security itself, I mean, security of 60. Uh, so we can take uh, that forward and increase our uh, depth in knowledge and technology, both uh, in the area of cyber security at IIT Jammu. Uh, because IIT Jammu is one of, one of the six new IITs which is running this course, apart from Tirupati. So we would like to carry that forward. We would like to discuss this with the director. I will also have a word with him. Our director, incidentally, is a PhD in computer science. So he understands cyber security much more than any one of us at <laughs> IIT Jammu understands. So yeah, I am sure, in fact, yeah. I copied this mail, but I did not ask him to attend the webinar because he will be busy somewhere. So uh, we can take it forward with the director, and then uh, we'll head and draft a MOU between Australian uh, University and IIT Jammu so that we can carry this association uh, forward for a longer time. Yeah, Raman. Hi, Raman. Thank you. Uh, I have a small point here. While the uh, university to university collaboration is going on in the academia to academia, that's wonderful. Our association would like to involve the industry as a partner. India has got 8,000 uh, small medium enterprise working into the aerospace defense sector. As per the government of India policy, the Ministry of Home Affairs issues defense industrial licenses to these companies. And there is a requirement by the government agencies. How do we sanitize these companies who are working into the aerospace defense sector? So my a suggestion would be while the training is going on there's a need of cyber audit of these uh, manufacturing entities spread all over india because they are working on highly confidential areas of defense and aerospace national security itself which can't be listed on this webinar itself so if uh, iit jammu and uh, mr john's team can work out some kind of a matrix how do i audit each industry for something like annual, biannual, how do I rate them? Suppose the government has to issue them some particular tender, are they fit to work on that area? Uh, well, everybody can arrange a ISMS certificate, but physical audit. I remember when I was in Wipro, we were working with Lockheed Martin. They actually did a 360 degree audit. So there's a need for an audit. Yeah. And uh, how do we do that certification? If that can be done an industry audit, so my team in uh, 20 cities all over India and our friends from Israel, if they want to join us, we need to have a benchmarking of company A, B, C. If they've done any hanky-panky, what was the audit, last two years audit? And if they have to work on a naval tender, on a nuclear submarine tender, are they having a rating which can allow them to participate in such a particular project? Commodore Naresh right. Kumar and uh, Mr. Vashni can add the point along with Mr. John. Over to you. Um, your, your thoughts on that, John? Yes, so, so my colleagues have a project currently under underway on supply chain cybersecurity 
and we okay. recognise that this is, from Australian defence experience, a, a, a serious issue because you might have your defence department with a very high level of cyber security maturity, but attackers will go after the weakest point, which is typically <laughs> further down the supply chain into sub, sub, subcontractors sometimes, and then work their way laterally with compromised um, credentials upwards into the treasure that they really want. So this issue of, of who you let through, who you vet, and how they become eligible and how you have confidence that a, sub, that a contractor can deliver the level of cyber security that you need them to have, that, that is a fundamental uh, issue for the overall strategic defence of your nation. Absolutely. And it's something that we would be keen to collaborate on. I think um, it's a huge area in terms of research opportunity. There's a parliamentary inquiry on at the federal level in Australia right now, looking at the supply chain, uh, both resilience, but also trust. And we go back to our webinar with the Israeli uh, cybersecurity directorate last week, and they are proposing uh, a some sort of certification, a global certification that all companies need to have in order to even just connect to the internet, some basic security uh, and cyber security posture. Uh, and then obviously that gets escalated as you go through. Um, and I think we do have, well, we do have programs like similar uh, for government suppliers here in Australia. It's benchmarking those uh, from a uh, defence arrangement country to country. Yeah. I, that's why I did want you to go back to that trust uh, slide, John, in terms of walking through. Yeah, there have been slide up, John, <laughs> on building trust, trust yes. in uh, data and trust in systems. Uh, yes. All I can say is that, of course, I am outdated, I'm not uh, up to date in technology, but when I was director of information technology in the Navy, we had issued a computer security policy uh, Navy wide, and all the companies, those who are doing naval projects, was supposed to follow this uh, computer security policy. Naturally, it had physical and data security components in it. And uh, the vulnerability audit of these companies was done uh, through naturally an IT expert company who can um, do the hacking and who can do all kinds of vulnerability and checks. So, but now I'm sure there are many companies in India who are undertaking this audit or who can undertake this audit uh, of any company uh, from all these angles. So what I will recommend is that Raman can identify four to five good IT security companies who can take security audit. The IT security policy of defense or doing a defense project or a defense tender is naturally, for example, Bharat Electronics doing most of they are They are bound by law to follow all the uh, defense security uh, guidelines and audits uh, to see that nothing is uh, leaked out, but uh, naturally there are vulnerabilities in every organization, but it can be formalized. What I want to know from John is that, is there a standard which says that, okay, I do audit and I achieve this level and this is the certification which I can give that this company is okay for doing level A, B, C, D kind of work. John? So there are... Is there an international uh, standard? Well, there's, there's work, for example, with the NIST uh, standards for cybersecurity. Yeah. Um, there's, a, a, there's COBIT and COZO and a range of other you know, acronym soup, basically, of, of different approaches with this. I would say there's not a single global accepted standard yet, but there's a lot of them under development. And what I suspect will occur in the next sort of five years is the the market will settle on one or two that are considered the best practice. Right. And that's does part IEEE, of... Yes. Yeah, so does IEEE have a chapter on cyber security? Yeah, yeah we you. have IEEE uh, general, specific journals which works on cyber security. We have specific chapters which are there on cyber security. So and uh, just been... adding on that point, so we have standards. We, we, we have certain standards currently in India, like uh, for most of the government sites uh, that we launch, we have to follow a certain India certificates, uh, out which we cannot launch those sites. 
We have certain certifications which are available for payment industry as well. So I think uh, those certification already playing a role in ensuring security. However, uh, uh, what I suggest is, let's suppose if you have to go further and make sure that the defense sector is secure, and, and uh, the companies which are auditing uh, or which are doing any kind of contract for the defense sector are well trusted. So I think any government agency, uh, which is like certain or uh, an agency which is actually promoted by government should do the audits uh, following the guidelines, like, such as GDPR is one of the guidelines which is being followed by a lot of commercial companies for data security and privacy. Uh, European yeah, Union has already sorry, uh, passed GDPR, which is uh, making sure that data is yeah, okay, so what uh, I think to conclude it, what can be done is a guideline can be drawn on this um, audit aspect uh, by IIT Jammu and Dr. Gaurav Vaishnavi can take a lead. And we can coordinate with Raman support to identify two to three companies or five companies, uh, including government companies, which can do the audit and certify. Is that right? Perfect. I think that's the approach yeah. we should follow. It is time the international standard comes. Then uh, the people, but international standard will not cover defense. We may cover the general, you know, all the rest of it. But also, when you're talking defense, you're yes, often yes, talking. Yes, yes. Sorry, we just have got a bit of a delay, I think. <laughs> okay. Um, we'll come yeah. back to yeah, please, please, back. Please wait. Sorry, go. Yeah. So, what I recommend is, Garo, you can get in touch with John and uh, make these guidelines as a start uh, from IIT Jammu to do the audit which is required for the Indian defense companies. Uh, we can do it jointly and then uh, start that as a uh, as a beginning. We can do that all. Am I okay, Raman? Is that okay? Yes, I have got a point here. Uh, just give me one second. Uh, see, when it comes to the uh, financial audits of various companies, we have certified chartered financial analysts itself. But yeah. over the last one or two years, what we realized in India, I am not sure about outside India, some of the auditors who were doing the financial uh, assessment itself were uh, hacked. That means yeah. if company ABC is doing the financial audit, they themselves were part of the scam. So my right. question is, while we are going to have this uh, cyber audit, who is going to do the cyber audit of the audit company itself? That is a question which I need to know from John. If the master itself is not uh, sincere enough, he's going to clear everybody how to ensure that the uh, strictness is maintained. So this is where you so have- Audit the auditor is something which I'm very much worried about. So the- you would need to have accredited auditors who have gotcha. met a higher standard themselves before they are able to go out and do the audits of the industry um, because we've seen uh, attempts not only by industry the, the subjects of the audit to hack the auditor but we've also seen when audit reports by, for example, the uh, Auditor General of Australia are published and they identify weaknesses, foreign actors have then been taking those reports and going, ah, now we know what to use <laughs> to launch our attacks. We're at a weak point there. <laughs> so we need to be careful about the, yeah. you know, there's a transparency and importance to publish those reports, but one would hope that there's a responsible reporting process, which we often have in the private sector, where a private sector entity discovers a, a flaw, reports that to Adobe or Microsoft or whoever has their product is, is flawed, gives them three to six months to fix it, and then ideally it's been fixed before it's published. Um, I realize that government agencies are perhaps a little bit slower to respond sometimes. They don't always have the resources that they should have. Um, but we do need to be careful that our audit reports can become shopping lists for attackers to launch, uh, to know what to launch to be most effective. And I think just on that note, just looking at the time, um, the idea is we'll keep the audience wanting more and uh, it's, uh, we only had one last question, uh, which was, 
Um, no, it's gone. I must have deleted it. Uh, it was mainly around defence uh, and courses around situational awareness. But I think what we'll do, John, um, either if we can get a copy of your slides, if you if we can, welcome to send that through. But otherwise, uh, a basic link. You should already have uh, those and obviously, slides. Chris. Yeah, and otherwise, uh, John is available on LinkedIn or something like that. If we can reach out or come back through to us. Um, just on the auditor's side, we are planning episode six at the end of the month to have. Uh, ISACA co uh, colleagues, uh, obviously um, or the auditors side, uh, both from Delhi and Sydney, and uh, we're going to try and bring in Kuala Lumpur as well. So have a sort of ISACA chapter, and obviously they're very focused on the standards and the auditing uh, aspect of that, um, and just how that outreach will work. So that's where we're heading. Um, I think we'll thank you, John. I've, I've taken back control of the screen, and you can finally see us again. Um, yes, I think on this particular, you know, as uh, Rahman sort of mentioned at episode one, this is a business orientated, industry orientated webinar series, uh, and we are looking for those opportunities, the trade and business opportunities uh, as professionals in this sector. So uh, if anyone in the audience has any specific questions or opportunities, please send that through. Uh, and it's like nice to see some interest there. Uh, both on the Institute side and also the Macquarie side, that that may uh, will, will support that moving forward uh, as well. Look, on that note, we'll uh, we'll finish up there. Um, any final comments, uh, Raman, that you'd like to follow up on, on that particular panel? Uh, I wanted to ask Mr. John, uh, do you have, in addition to the uh, training programs in your university, a concept of setting up a cyber range uh, which so we, we would like to set up in India. Uh, you can uh, send me a mail uh, separately. What is the range of investment required to set up a cyber range? Okay. And uh, there are uh, some private uh, investors with us who want to invest this kind of, uh, you know, while IIT is taking the lead, but uh, we may have more than one facility, a private sector with, uh, you know, industry requirement would like to sanitize the hardware and of course it will be you know industry academia and uh, you know collaboration itself so obviously if private sector wants to invest in setting up a cyber range it can be overseen by the iit jammu and of course collaboration with uh, mr john and his team yeah any thoughts on that so we have with our partner optus who's one of the sponsors of our hub um access to a cyber their cyber range um, we also have uh, Australian University colleagues who have uh, set up cyber ranges as well. Uh, we have not needed to set up our own range because we have the Optus one to tap into, but I, I'm happy to connect you to people who have more experience in the in the, the setup and the budgeting for cyber ranges okay. who could then help you um, with their learned experience from having done it. And not only setting up, it's the sustainability of the business model for the cyber range um, because it's not just a matter of builders and they will come. Uh, you need to have an active and effective marketing strategy and the right um, exercises within the range to attract the audience that will that will cover the costs and get you a return on investment. That's, that's my job. Yeah. And I think uh, definitely from an Australian perspective, we see the pool of uh, uh, the pool of uh, people to be educated in India uh, as as a real opportunity as well. Uh, I mentioned the Adelaide uh, Cyber Collaboration Centre. That's I think including a range. We've also covered off in Perth uh, with Edith Cowan University, um, and as uh, John mentions with Optus as well. So. We have the models, and it might be something we cover off in, in more detail, Raman, at least some links to some cyber ranges. And, and uh, if um, our Indian colleagues, if you identify any in India uh, or hear of any, maybe uh, let us know as well. We can uh, maybe compare apples and oranges or uh, whatever they, they may well be. I'm sure there is a, a difference. So look, on that note, we will close, close off. Um, just some closing slides. On our marketplace, we uh, we did have Optus uh, Macquarie Cybersecurity Hub on there as well in terms of their courses. 
Um, but we do have some basic cybersecurity training that we are trying to implement. And I mentioned ISACA and their cybersecurity labs. There's about uh, uh, nine key labs that you can run, relatively low cost. And I think that's one aspect with cyber. You don't have to go off and do a full PhD and a doctorate. Uh, you can start with uh, certain fields within cybersecurity as well. Um, just a quick plug for the marketplace in terms of the latest reports. These are, um, I haven't updated these, but we have a range of industry reports and white papers that come out day to day and these change uh, well, exactly that week to week as well. Uh, so it's worth having a look at what, what's new on the marketplace. And we're looking at setting up a, a Slack channel. So anyone who's interested in that, particularly uh, as we develop this webinar series uh, and people want to stay in touch uh, over a longer period of time, I think Slack might be a suitable aspect to that, particularly for learning uh, and sharing. Our Cybersecurity Weekly podcast, I mentioned uh, we've just launched or just put out the audio file from our Israel uh, series that's just gone live. Uh, there's still some book giveaways on this particular podcast. Um, so if it's a basic uh, sending in the code after listening to the podcast, you'll get a free copy of Maury Haber's uh, most recent book on privileged attack vectors. And on that note, we've also on the Australian Cybersecurity Magazine, there's an opportunity there for a free book on privileged attack. Uh, and this is uh, Maury's, I think it's his first book of the identity attack vectors too, uh, for that. I thought that was the best we could do, Roman, in terms of a giveaway uh, at the end of this particular series. And uh, on that note, um, this session was recorded and it will be out in the next sort of 24 to 48 hours on our YouTube channel. And we'd like to thank our guests. Uh, John Selby, thank you very much for your time. Uh, very worthwhile. And uh, Shane Darley couldn't uh, join us also. Uh, and our friends in, uh, in India, both in Delhi and uh, Jammu. Uh, Mr. Farshnay and- Bollier. Where was Mr. it? Mr. Borough was in Gwalior. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, Gwalior. Yeah, it's Gwalior. Okay, got it. Uh, Gaurav, thank you very much for joining us there. Uh, and uh, Commodore Kumar uh, there in Delhi also. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you so on our much. Virtual Chris. educational series. Thank Namaste. You. We'll see you next week. Same time, Thank same you. bat channel. Thank you so Thank much. You. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah.